Okay, this is Peter O'Rourke uh, with NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, we will start the virtual training session on Coastal Oil Spills Standard Operating Guidance Document. The trainers today will be Bruce Oswald and Melissa Langclose, uh, who, among other things, work with NAPSIG Foundation on um, putting together these sorts of technical documents uh, for the public safety community. Um, this is our first uh, particular SOG that is rele relevant to both the public safety and the environmental community, so we're particularly excited to um, host this training session. And without further ado, uh, Bruce and Melissa, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, ah, I mean, a little technical difficulty. Hi, uh, this is Bruce Oswald, and as Peter said, Melissa Lanclose is uh, with me today. And we're going to be going through um, the uh, coastal oil spill SOG just to give you uh, an idea of what's in it, how you can use it, and where you can get it. Um, one of the things that we know and we've learned over the last few months is that there's a great need uh, for uh, the development of standard operating procedures uh, between GIS practitioners and uh, emergency management personnel in responding to coastal oil spills. And it doesn't have to be a Deepwater Horizon oil spill or, or an Exxon Valdez. Uh, because oil spills happen on a regular basis, in fact, a daily basis uh, along the coast of the United States. Wow, my computer's not doing well here. So a little bit about uh, Melissa and myself. Um, I served as the project manager for NABSIC on this. I did a bit of writing, uh, a, a lot of editing. Um, and my previous background and experience was with uh, New York State as their uh, GI, state GIS coordinator. We, we were involved in a number of emergency management operations during my uh, tenure there, and uh, both uh, natural uh, disasters as well as obviously man-made ones as well. I've worked in the private sector for the last few years and worked for the National States Geographic Information Council as a consultant, and then over this past year with NABSIC. Melissa? Thank you, Bruce. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Hancloss, and um, I have about 15 years of experience in the GIS field. Um, for this project, I came in um, kind of helping Bruce in the project management side and acting as the primary author on the actual document. Um, I have a background, like I said, in GIS. I've done several project management jobs throughout my life, um, throughout my career. Um, natural Resources was actually my first job, and it focused on how GIS could help with environmental decisions. And working on this project has kind of gotten me back to being able to, to do that a little bit. And um, it's just been really interesting learning about coastal oil spills, this process, the policies that go into it, um, the data, just the different things that the working group has taught us. Okay, well, thank you, Melissa. And so the training is, uh, as Peter said, is provided to you by NAPSIG. Uh, it has been funded through the Department of Homeland Security's Geospatial Management Office. Um, Peter has provided us with the oversight, not only for the training, but even more importantly, for putting the SOG together. And he brought in a number of people, experts in the field, and introduced us to them and provided overall guidance in putting this thing together. So what we're going to cover today is why geospatial policies and public safety, a little bit about our work group, the project goals, the audience this is attended for, a little bit about the process we use, things we learned, that uh, some of which were actually very surprising to us. Melissa is going to be going into great details on the uh, SOG content, as well as uh, tips on how you can use it. And then I'll wrap it up with where you can get the SOG and, and, and how to get things started. Uh, I'm not big in policy myself, but, but uh, it is important, and I know from my experience working in emergency management, um, that we really need to do everything we can to encourage improved communication and collaboration um, between the GIS practitioners and the emergency uh, response personnel. It's, it's something that, that you need to make a concerted effort in the beginning, but you have to nurture this and work with this over time. 
And we think the template that's, uh, that's been put together here is really a, a tool that can help agencies get started in developing their own policies. And we want to emphasize it's their own policies. This is just a tool. Use the parts that work best for you and then go from there. Um, the key thing is, overall, you need to institutionalize uh, the use of geospatial assets uh, during uh, oil spill emergency responses. And, and that involves a lot of upfront work, a lot of training, and a lot of perseverance. Uh, this this uh, actual guideline is a uh, part of partnership between NAPSIC and the National State Geographic Informational Council uh, and uh, the DHS's GMO. It was developed with input from all levels of government, as well as the private sector and non-for-profits. And uh, NAPSIC really wants to thank all the partners that helped put this together and make this the, the document that it is. A little, little bit about the work group. Uh, we didn't come up with a specific number of people to start in putting this uh, together with a work group, uh, but it, it uh, through the people that Peter introduced us to, as well as others that were that were brought on here, uh, it grew and it grew to 21. And then, if you add Melissa and myself, 23 uh, people and people from all sorts of walks of life. And I'm I'm listed the the contributors here. Uh, a lot of people from the Coast Guard that worked on Deepwater Horizon. Bill Burgess, the Washington liaison from NISJIC, who worked for years for the state of Maryland and actually did oil spill response, not necessarily as the GIS practitioner, but, but actually went out in the field on this stuff. And then we have people from different states, like uh, uh, the state of Florida, Richard Bucherite, and he suggested other people from his state to bring in here. And then people from Alabama, uh, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, uh, a, a private sector, uh, Tanner Canise, who actually worked for the oil company, so that provided a little bit of a uh, different uh, perspective. Rusty Liner from from uh, Louisiana, and excuse me, and Ginger McMillan from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, who also actually worked on a Deepwater Horizon incident. Rand Napoli uh, from the Board of Directors of NAPSIC was, was, uh, provided us with input and, I, and ideas and people to bring in uh, from the firefighting community within Florida that actually had worked on this, such as Rick Talbert from South, the South Walton Fire District, uh, Harvey Simon from the EPA, who I've known for a number of years, and then uh, Mike Van Hook from, from Alabama. So those are the kinds of people we had involved in there, and we really worked hard to ensure um, that the, their role was one of providing expertise, uh, opinions, examples, and making sure uh, that we did the, the grunt work and they did uh, uh, the expertise work. A number of goals that we had in mind for this project as we started out, obviously develop a template that others can use at the state and local government uh, level, uh, provide guidance for GIS professionals who may not have necessarily backgrounds in oil, coastal oil spills to get them up to speed as quickly as possible, and also to help emergency management professionals understand how GIS can be an effective tool to make them uh, allow them to do their jobs better. And then and Melissa will talk about some of the key things that we found in there that were needed for success, both from the emergency management perspective, but also from the GIS perspective. And then, and then we needed to make sure that whatever we uh, produced was consistent with the Department of Homeland Security's uh, geospatial concept of operations, as well as NAPSIC standard SOG. And then we wanted to make sure that it was out there and easily disseminated across the country, and, and NAPSICs put it up on their website for easy download. Two parts to the audience here. Uh, the GIS practitioners that need to know what their requirements are within the emergency management community, and the emergency management professionals that need to know how GIS and geospatial technologies can better support them and make them uh, 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 better able to respond to coastal oil spills, whether they're at the local, state, or federal levels. So what was the process? Well, we started uh, almost exactly a year ago in October. Peter kicked us off 
Um, and to be honest, Melissa and my, and my background, uh, although we were involved in a number of things along the way, didn't I, I my total experience on oil spills were things that dripped from my car, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we conducted a lot of research up front. We developed a list of questions that we felt that GIS could provide uh, answers to uh, for the emergency uh, management uh, community and related to oil spills. And then we tested those out with interviews with experts along the way. And we conducted, a, oh, God, uh, 12, 15 or more interviews over the course of three months. And part of that process provided us with expertise other parts of that process provided us with, with a rapport with people that later became work group members. In January of uh, 2013, the outline was put together uh, for the SOG. It was sent to our, our work group, and this was generally the process that we did. We'd, we put together the, uh, the draft materials, we sent it to the work group, they edited it, provided comments, we redid it, and then we'd have a meeting and discuss everything and move on from there. So that happened in, in uh, January and February, we had our work, first work group meeting. The uh, first draft was put together of the document, another uh, iteration of comments and work groups and, and, and meetings, and then, and then we went through the entire process uh, and, and uh, uh, we're able to finalize the, the draft and get it to the Department of Homeland Security in June. And I, Melissa pointed out to me the other day that we'd actually gone through nine different drafts of this. So it, it was a very iterative process. It worked very well. Uh, and so in September, obviously, we were able to schedule the training and, and get the SOG up on the website. So there's a number of things that we learned, perhaps because of our ignorance of oil spills, uh, and perhaps uh, 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 there are things that others don't know. We thought we'd put those together. Um, Bill Burgess was the one that said to me originally, um, hey, um, I was on oil spills. We went out on a daily basis in the state of Maryland. They may be very small. It may be, uh, it may be a, a tanker pulls up to offload uh, their oil and uh, something happens and there's a spill or it could be uh, something being unloaded to a barge that's going further up a river or even just a, a, a ship that uh, runs aground and starts leaking. Um, but you know, there also is the Exxon Valdez and a Deepwater Horizon thing. So, but they happen on a regular basis. There's a, 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 some protocols that have been put in place uh, as far as the national response system. Uh, here's one reference here. The Coast Guard has also created an incident management handbook, which uh, is is useful and it was something is something you might want to consider. Uh, there's a number of things in there, and we'll talk a little bit more about about other things later on. Um, one of the things that became reality along the way is that there are, when you get reports as, as a uh, GIS professional on the volume of oil that spilled, you have to understand the perspective of the, uh, the uh, party that's giving you that information. And whether if it's coming from, um, we'll say, the party that uh, may have caused the oil spill, uh, the volume reports may be, uh, tend to be on the lower side, whereas, whereas it's, if it's the regulators, it may be on the higher side. So you just need to keep that perspective uh, in your mind as you're looking at the information. Booming. We learned a tremendous amount about booming. There are a number of different types of booms. The fact that uh, during uh, the Deepwater Horizon incident, uh, people were out there, GIS professionals, did almost all, all their time was dedicated to tracking uh, the type of booms, where they were put out, when they were put out. The booms were used to keep oil out of sensitive areas uh, or to contain it if it's a smaller incident. And that it, it's very, uh, there's a minimal amount of wind that impacts, that can impact the booms, whether it's that or tides or waves or things like that. So while you may have them deployed out there, they can become less effective depending on the uh, atmospheric conditions. The coastal um, oil spill uh, cleanup is there's a number of things out there that that uh, 
are plans and tools in place that we didn't understand. This is this is all governed under the Oil Prevention Act of 1990, and it requires that sensitivity, environmental sensitivity indexes be created that indicate the sensitivity of coastal areas across the country. There are response plans and contingency plans that detail how those uh, areas are to be protected by booming and other things. You need to know that. You need to have that information at your fingertips if you're going to be successful as a GIS professional in responding to these kinds of emergencies. And then lastly, uh, during the Exxon Valdez uh, incident, NOAA put together uh, something called SCAT, the Shoreline Cleanup and Assessment Tool, which is a really good tool for uh, people in the field to use to uh, indicate the damage uh, that's occurred due to oil. There are places to get out there and get imagery. The International Charter is one in which um, nations agree to provide imagery to other nations from their satellites uh, in, in times of disaster when, when it's requested on a national basis. And I just looked up uh, over the weekend, the one currently in play for the U.S. is in, in Colorado. Uh, the United States uh, Geological Survey's Eros Data Center provides uh, a data distribution point for their hazards data, uh, data distribution system, and you can get both imagery and vector data from there. And then lastly, uh, there is a, uh, a mechanism in which states can acquire staffing, additional staffing during an emergency from other states. For instance, you could get a GIS professional from an adjoining state. Rates for those professionals have already been established, and it's in place, and you can work through your emergency management operations center to uh, uh, see about those. We put together a checklist, uh, which is in the appendix, uh, which is approved, uh, uh, seems to be quite valuable, and people are, are anxious to get a hold of that. Uh, there is an elaborate three-year training program, which the Coast Guard and their Instrument Management Handbook has put together. We're not saying you need to train for three years, but there's some good things in there that you can use uh, as part of your training. And then there's a bunch of resources that NOAA has that uh, we think will be valuable to you as well. Okay, well, let me turn it over to Melissa, who's going to go through the content now. And uh, take it away, Melissa. Thank you, Bruce. Well, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm going to spend a little time going through the content of the SOG, kind of um, the big the big points that you need to understand and kind of the big headings and explain each of them to you so you have a little bit better understanding of the document once you download it. Um, I'm also going to explain how this document can be used just briefly, uh, kind of how the document is set up, what the different um, highlighted areas mean and whatnot. So getting right into this, the core of the document really has two main parts. So what emergency managers and first responders need to know about GIS and how they can use GIS during an incident. And then secondly, what GIS professionals need to know about how GIS can be utilized by emergency managers and first responders before, during, and after an oil spill. So really our goal with this document is to help both groups understand their own role and then also the role of the other group in order to utilize GIS to its fullest potential. So I'm going to highlight the document's key concepts that each group need to understand for GIS to be effective during an event. So let's start with how GIS can assist emergency managers and first responders. This document gives a brief description of what GIS is. Uh, we know not everyone is familiar with GIS and really haven't had the opportunity to use it. And so if that's the case with an emergency management group, we want to give some general information about GIS. There's a section that gives examples of the type of questions GIS can be used to answer. Um, this is especially helpful if emergency managers and first responders haven't used GIS before. Um, they may not know, why, well, you know, how do I use this? What do I do with it? So some examples that we give include, has the oil reached the shore yet? Uh, what is the status of the booming operations? As Bruce mentioned, that was, that's a big thing with oil spills. Um, what recess, resources are at risk? So you can look at, you know, sensitive, environmentally sensitive areas, uh, the shoreline, if it's an area that, maybe had some endangered species along it or whatnot. So those are the types of questions that, you know, GIS can answer, and we want to help emergency responders know what they can, can look into. The document also stresses the importance of including GIS in the organization's workflow. So the successful implementation of GIS is really dependent on seeing where it fits best in your current workflow, and it also looks for opportunities to enhance or expand into new areas. 
this should be done prior to an incident. Doing so really helps to ensure that GIS can be used to its fullest potential. And you'll hear Bruce and I say that several times during this presentation, just that so much of this, as he stated earlier, is upfront preparation, upfront implementation, kind of getting things set up before an incident. Um, also, if you incorporate GIS into your workflow, it helps get the emergency management team familiar with the GIS and ultimately helps the GIS team understand emergency response because there's that communication up front about where it fits in. Another key point is incorporating GIS into pre-incident training. So this re kind of reinforces the point listed with incorporating it into the workflow. If you add GIS to your training, that really has several critical benefits. So firstly, it kind of helps emergency responders become familiar with GIS. They're going to understand it better. They're going to see where it fits better. Um, like I said, it, it, number two, it shows where GIS fits into the workflow and how it can add value to respond. So you want to you want to get your emergency management team familiar with it. You want to kind of see where it fits in your workflow. And then it also helps the GIS professionals to understand the emergency response and helps them to be prepared for high pressure, pressure situations. Most GIS professionals are in high stress, high we have to get this done right away situations. Most people are working in parcels or, or you know, document management as far as just various GIS professions that don't involve time critical information. And so if you do this training up front, your emergency responders are going to be way more familiar with how GIS fits into the plan. And it's also going to really help the GIS professionals um, be prepared to, to deal with these high pressure situations. So next, a key to adding GIS to emergency response is upfront communication about products and expectations. So really, again, pre-incident, you want to establish what types of products you want. Do you want maps showing certain data, like platform locations or sensitive species, boom locations, things of that nature? Um, do you want analysis of such data as wind speed, direction? Do you want to see oil trajectories? You know, and you want to kind of establish pre-incident how often you will need updated maps or information for briefings. So the more open the communication is, the better and more useful the GIS will be. And you want to do all of that pre-incident, and you want to kind of set up those products and expectations early. Along those same lines, you want to come up with a pre-incident list of questions GIS can answer. So that kind of goes back to what we talked about before of once you understand how GIS can be used in your workflow, it can really help you set up these questions that GIS can answer. So you want to brainstorm specifics. Maps that you always need, maybe, that are specific to your organization, like I always want to know the distribution of my teams. And so maybe you want to make sure that that's incorporated into the questions you're answering. Um, maybe there's analysis you always rely on. So maybe your particular organization focuses on booming locations. So maybe you want the analysis that the GIS professionals do to focus on what the weather is doing, what the tides are doing, what the wind are, is doing. As Bruce pointed out, that's really a big factor with booming. Um, also, maybe you want to talk early about what data should be in-house. If there's specific data sets or specific questions that you want answered, really pre-event come up with, okay, these are the questions we have. Now, what data do we need to get now, get early, get pre-incident, have in-house and on-hand to answer those questions? It's important to understand that GIS does require pre-planning for implementation. It's, it's, it takes a little bit of upfront um, information. You need hardware, you need software, you need data. They're all needed to run a GIS. So again, pre-incident, you want to get a list of data needs to be established. You want to see what your hardwares are, hardware is needed and get that infrastructure set up to run the system. You want to purchase and install your software. So the document discusses the availability of resources that not only help you to implement the GIS, but also to kind of get that data. So we talk about data clearing houses to obtain those data sets base data such as roads and streams, more specific data for oil spill incidents like boat ramps or airports or building footprints, things that um, maybe wouldn't be included in a base map but be really useful for an oil spill map. Um, we suggest that you really engage with your regional response teams. So there's 13 RRTs across the United States and they provide guidance and work to provide assistance during an event. They're a really good resource for clearinghouse data, GIS tools, GIS information, and so all of that kind of runs into that pre-planning, pre-implementation of the hardware, the software, the data. Contact your RRTs and find out, you know, have them help you locate what you need to really get this GIS incorporated into your response. Um, also, NAPSIG has a quick guide that's available on their website, and it's a great additional resource to just kind of um, give you another perspective and another document to, to help you along the way with in instilling GIS. Um, next slide, please, Bruce. So next, let's talk about what GIS professionals need to know about emergency management. And this is kind of a little bit bigger portion of the document because this is, um, we 
want GIS people to really understand emergency management and what goes into that. As a GIS professional, you may never have worked in an emergency situation before, and you may be pulled in to help on an incident. Sometimes they need GIS backup, and you are the parcel editor who needs to be pulled in. So it's really important to be able to understand emergency management. The document explains the emergency organizational structure of MAC, which are multi-agency coordination system. It also discusses a lot of other um, uh, elements that go into emergency response, unified commands, um, incident command systems, which are command structures that are set up in the field, NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System, and that was released by Department of Homeland Security uh, a number of years ago and offers a standardized approach to incident management and response. Um, defining that terminology and explaining these different systems, we feel really will help GIS professionals to understand the system that they'll be working in. And the better they understand the system, the more efficient their GIS will be. The document introduces legislation and policy specifics to oil spill response um, as well. Um, policies such as OPA 90 and the International Charter. OPA 90 is the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, and it was signed into law in August of 1990 and established contingency requirements in the event of a spill. And as Bruce mentioned earlier, the International Charter is a unified system of space data acquisition meant to deliver data during an event. So it's a way to get data during an event and, and, and fill the needs of your GIS. Um, it's critical for GIS professionals who will be helping with incidents to understand these policies, and these are just a, a few of the legislation and policy that are in place. We go into a detail about a few others. But in order for them to really be efficient and effective in using GIS, it's really critical to understand these. Um, we also wanted to provide a basic list of data specific to oil spill incidents. As I mentioned before, a lot of times GIS professionals maybe aren't completely familiar with emergency response scenarios. Um, so. This is data the GIS team may have never needed before, but will need in the future. And um, just to be clear, our list acts as a starting point. So this comes back into making this document personal to your organization. You know, add to this list, um, expand this list, make it real specific to your organization. But it's really a starting point for GIS professionals to understand what kind of data goes into responding to coastal oil spills. So examples might be booms. Uh, the types of booms that are available, um, platform locations, maybe that's something that you would you would need to do some mapping, ESI boundaries, ACP boundaries, boat mooring locations. Um, it's important that they really become familiar with oil-specific data sets prior to an incident so that as they're mapping these these incidents, they have the correct data. It is also, it's also recommended in this document to establish standard GIS products prior to a national event. So discuss the needs and requested products with the emergency management team and really get to know what, they, what they're looking for. So set up templates with standard formatting and maybe pre-established data sets that you know will always be included in their maps. And that helps to ensure timely delivery of the information because kind of as it was mentioned before, these are, these are response times that you need to, to deal with quickly. You can't take two weeks to make a map. It needs to be in, it needs to be out the door, it needs to be used in briefings. So really you want timely delivery of the information and setting up these templates will be helpful. And that's actually something you'll hear us say quite a bit throughout the presentation. Um, next slide, please, Bert. Um, GIS professionals need to understand that emergency response is really time sensitive. As I've already mentioned and as it's been stated before, they need to understand the need for speed. They need to be prepared with that pre-incident established products. They need to understand the response in a coastal oil spill is a very quick turnaround. And just, you know, set up those templates. Let talk to your emergency management team and understand what they're really looking for. The more prepared you are, the the more of an opportunity you'll actually have to do additional GIS, answer additional questions and not focus on these, these base maps that they need kind of at the beginning of an event. GIS professionals should be incorporated into pre-incident training. And I kind of mentioned that in an earlier slide in the emergency management section, but training is critical. And incorporating the GIS team into the training helps ensure everyone is comfortable during the real incident. It gets the two teams familiar with each other and really creates more of a one-team mentality. Um, next slide, please. So now let's talk through some of the standard operating procedures for the coastal oil spill response. Um, as Bruce mentioned earlier, we came up with an SOG checklist. It was really a much requested part of the document. When we started sitting down with the working group, we were, one, surprised that one didn't already exist that was fairly detailed, and two, um, surprised at how much that was a requested document. Um, it's a checklist that's intended to be a starting point 
for an organization to use when they set up their own SOG. So as you go through and, and modify this document and make it really personal to your organization, we want this um, checklist to be modified as well. And we put a lot of information in it, so you may end up having to take out half of it. Maybe you don't need the pre-incident information, maybe you don't need the post-incident information, but um, maybe you do. And there may be things in there that we missed. So um, we want it to be completely customizable to your organization. The document talks about GIS staffing and resource requirements. Really, it's critical to evaluate and understand and implement the necessary hardware, software, data, the general resources, everything I talked about before that a GIS team needs to assist during an incident. We really talk about in the document, too, how in a perfect world, there's access to internet, the network has a connectivity, there's no issues with power, but we don't live in a perfect world, and we certainly don't live in a perfect world during an incident. So really, you need to establish resource requirements, taking into account when you have to work disconnected. And we really kind of get into the importance of that. You need to come up with ideas, you know, if it works great if you've got power, and it works great if you've got network connectivity, but what do you do if the power is down or your guys can't sync back to the main database? You know, do you go back to paper maps? Do you use cell phones with geo-enabled pictures? It's, it just kind of goes into how you need to think about these things from various different perspectives. Um, the document also provides a basic roles table and a basic resource requirements table. That, again, is meant to be modified by you. Um, they're starting points to customize your organization's needs. So maybe what we call a deputy team leader, you call something completely different. So we want you to go in and change those roles, change those responsibilities, and really customize that to fit your organization. Next slide, please, Bruce. So staffing and team transition. It would be really great if you could try to establish your GIS team ahead of time. And there's really several benefits to that. Um, it gives the emergency response team and the GIS group time to train together, as we mentioned before, and work together pre-event, kind of to establish, you know, these products and these, these data sets that are important. Um, so you get that team building opportunity if you've got your GIS team pre-established. Um, helps with communication, helps with working relationships, kind of is just an all-around win situation. Um, also, pre-establishing the team really allows for more efficient scheduling. So you can kind of, if you know who your basic team is and basically know who has kids or who has a second job or who has various commitments, you could really kind of structure your team ahead of time of who's going to be on first shift and who's going to be on second shift. And really one of the most important things the document discusses is the need for overlapping shifts. So your teams can brief each other on data, uh, talk about issues they've encountered throughout their shift, update the team on the next shift coming in where the, the process currently sits. And so... That's kind of one of those things that maybe as a GIS team, you don't you think, oh, we're going to go into the mapping, but really we stress the importance of, of having these two shifts, of having open communication between the shifts and making sure you're, you overlap quite a bit. Um, going on to communication, um, I've said this, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped file naming and data structure. I'm not going to go into a super amount of detail on that anyways. Um, the document discusses the need for standardizing your file naming conventions and your data structures. We give examples for both of those, but that's not a real... Um, exciting section, so I'm just going to breeze through that um, and go on to communication. And the reason I tried to skip forward to this is because communication is really critical. And I know that Bruce and I will say communication several times during this presentation, but really, you know, pre-event, during the event, post-event, you just really want to make sure that you have open communication. Um, during the actual event, there's usually multiple agencies involved during during it, and depending on the size of the event, will determine how many different agencies are involved. Um, efficiency is very important when you're dealing with response. And good communication is critical to achieving your goals quickly. So, you know, really you want your GIS team to have really good communication amongst itself and amongst the, the emergency response team as well. This document actually highlights several other communication opportunities that GIS professionals should be aware of when they're dealing with the response. So first, um, local and state GIS emergency responders that maybe are outside of your immediate organization. You know, you're going to, the more agencies come in, the more GIS professionals are going to potentially be involved. And so you want to be aware that there's going to be some communication as this ramps up. You're going to have additional um, positions and people coming on board. Um, GIS coordination calls and distribution lists. These happen during an event, certainly, but they probably happen on a regular basis as well outside of an event. Just coordination calls that get people, you know, on the same page as far as maybe policies that have changed or mm -hmm. data sets locally that are available, things like that. So 
pre-event and again during the event, you want to kind of find out if there's these coordination calls and distribution lists that you might want to be on just to keep up with what's going on in the area. Um, the last two areas that are opportunities for communication are special interest groups and the public. And um, those are definitely places where communication is needed, maybe not directly from the GIS team to those entities, but within your own team as far as who's dealing with the special interest groups, you know, who's dealing with the public, what the GIS team's level of commitment is to communicate with those groups. And it may be dealing with your, your press liaison. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But really, communication, I can't stress enough, is key pre, during, post event. We just, you want to keep those lines open as best as possible. Um, mapping protocols are very, very important. You want a uniform look and feel to facilitate the ease of use and interpretability of your products. Um, the document offers several guidelines when creating map products and like a common operating picture, consumable services, uh, web-based APIs, things of that nature, map templates. You just want to make sure that you've got these mapping protocols in place so that your, your products look and feel the same so that people in an emergency situation can look at them, interpret them, read them easily, and move on. Uh, next slide, please, Bruce. So data protocols, again, you want to establish pre-event what format your data will be delivered in and set up backup policies. Those are two really critical things. You don't want to, during the beginning of an event, say, well, we're using file databases, or we're using shapefiles. We need to have that established up front. And your backup policy, of course, is critical. You don't want to have one of those power surges during an event or have something go down and as you're set up in the field and lose everything. Um, the document also discusses maybe how the data will be shared and who will have access to it and if web applications will come into play. Data acquisition and dissemination. Again, we recommend establishing briefing cycles at the beginning of an incident. Do this stuff up front. And maybe um, the GIS team itself isn't going to establish what the briefing cycle will be, but find out from your emergency response team what it will be so you can be prepared with maps. It'll change. It'll shift. But just to kind of know what it is up front will be very helpful. Also, we recommend creating a data management plan. And that data management plan, the purpose of that is to tell you when the data will be pushed out, when the GIS team will have access to it to create the map products. It will include data formats, how data will be collected both on and offline if, you know, you lose power, data delivery schedule, expectations, many other things. Um, QAQC should be established and know your press policy. This is where you really need to know. Put that in the data management plan. Know who should be dealing with the press, who should be dealing with special interest groups, how things will be pushed out to the website. Um, the document provides a list of minimum essential data sets and resources that you might want to think about including in that data management plan. Um, documentation of metadata. During an event, it's really difficult to actually document what's going on because it's high paced. Things are happening quickly. Um, but really, it's important to at least document, you know, what process was used to create data or to run analysis and do metadata light in the very least. It's critical to know the bare minimum information, such as, you know, where the data came from, who created it, and when. If you know that, that at least gives people an idea of how and when it can be used. Um, recovery, um, as Bruce mentioned earlier, um, we deal with um, SCAT, among other things, a shoreline cleanup assessment technique um, and several other damage assessment techniques that are used um, during the event and after an event. And training, again, um, we recommend pre-incident pre training. That includes the GIS team. Um, U.S. Coast Guard, Department of Transportation, EPA, and Department of the Interior have created this national pre document, which is the Preparedness for Response Exercise Program. And really, its goal is a workable exercise program to ensure adequate response preparedness during an oil spill event. Um, and also, as this document is, is modified for your specific organization, if you come up with a really great training exercise or you come up with something that works really well, NAPSIG would love to have you donate that and have that incorporated into future versions of this document so that we can really, you know, get some information out there for people who maybe don't know where to even start with training. Next slide, please, Bruce. Um, the document includes three appendixes. The first one is that SOG checklist that we've spoken about so many times. Again, modify it to fit your needs and let us know if there's some big hole we've missed. Appendix two is a list of acronyms, terms, and definitions. And um, that's intended to help GIS professionals understand emergency management terms and vice versa. So we'd like you to please, please add to that and then donate that information back. We've put as many terminology 
items in there as we can think of, but I know we're missing huge things in there. And we want that to be a very comprehensive list of acronyms and terms and definitions to really help people understand um, uh, emergency management speak, so to speak, when they're in the middle of an event. Um, the final appendix is an example of products and programs that um, where GIS has been integrated into emergency response. So that's a really great resource for maybe if you're getting started with, oh gosh, how do I get GIS incorporated into my emergency response plan for coastal oil spills? Go to the site. The site's listed on this page. See how other people have integrated GIS. Um, if you create a really great site, again, we'd love to include yours in this appendix as well. Okay, next slide, please, Bruce. So real quickly, I just want to go through a few tips on how the SOG can actually be used. Um, as I've mentioned, as Bruce has mentioned, this is a template. We want you to modify, customize, use it to meet your specific goals of your agency or organization. The document is set up, um, you just kind of get an understanding of the document. Each section of the document has background information that we put in a blue text box. That is a general overview of the section. It'll act as a guide as you go through the information just to kind of set up the section for you. There are some placeholders intended for you to fill in your specific information, and as you can see here on the slide where it says local jurisdictional input is needed, it's bold, it's italicized, it has carrots, and that just delineates spaces where we put placeholders for you to incorporate your own information. Um, examples are given in motion quotes and provide the user with tips on interpreting the examples given, and diagrams are also marked as examples and are meant for input from the user. All of these are references. Um, they don't set a standard. They're all just starting points for you to make this document your own. Bruce, the next slide, please. So finally, um, we want you to use this document. We want to exercise it and modify it. Um, as you use it and conduct exercises, it's going to shift. It's going to change to fit your needs. And it should change. It should evolve as your responses change. And as technology changes and as policy changes, this document should change. And we plan on putting out additional versions. And, and those changes would be very helpful in understanding how this document can be very up to date. Um, so we would love you to share anything. But even if it's just your experience, um, we want to make that, these future drafts better. Um, involve your RRTs. Incorporate that resource along with the document and along with your physical exercises that you go out with the groups to do. Those will do nothing but strengthen your version of the SOG and make this usable and, and specific to your organization. So at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Bruce to explain where you can get the SOG. Thank you. Yeah, so um, now you've heard it, uh, all the details from uh, Melissa. Um, I have down here in a couple of slides a very long and complicated um, uh, web address to uh, access this, and I thought over the weekend, well, gee, let's make this a little easier. So if you want to get a hold of this uh, SOG, simply go to the NAPSIC Foundation website. That's www.napsicfoundation.org. Uh, go to their blog in the, in the upper right tab. Select it, and then there'll be a drop down, and then click on the NAPSIC blog. It'll take you to this page, and on that page, you will see that there are four SOG related materials. Um, there's the overall NAPSIG SOG, and then there's two new ones here uh, one for oil spills and one for wildfires that Peter mentioned. And if you click on the oil spill one, you can download it. It's just as simple as that. The best part about this whole thing, it's no cost. And, and all that NAPSIG asks uh, is that as you implement these, uh, your own version of this, that you provide us with feedback. Tell us what worked for you, what didn't work, uh, and, I, and new ideas that you may have uh, to uh, make this even better. We'd really appreciate that. So it's time to get started. Uh, if you are a GIS practitioner, talk with your emergency management uh, personnel. If you're in the emergency management arena and don't have GIS practitioners involved, find out about that and, uh, you know, together learn what the emergency managers need and what GIS can provide. And for more information to how to integrate this, uh, NAPSIG also has something called the Capabilities Ready and Assessment Tool. Uh, it's a tool where you can find out how ready you are and, and maybe uh, help you to uh, analyze where you need to have additional resources. Uh, develop a plan to integrate this uh, GIS into the emergency management workflow. Um, 
familiarize yourself with this SOG. Take the parts that work for you and, and use those, as well as the Department of Homeland Security's geospatial concept of operations. And then work together between the GIS practitioners and emergency responders to, to be, be able to put together a standard operating procedure that will work for you. Uh, find out where the data is. Uh, get the hold of the data. Remember, things go wrong, and if, if, you, if you're counting on the Internet, sometimes it isn't always there. So get the best you can and, and locate it, know how to use it, put it into your templates, uh, and then just train with it. Exercise uh, within the, uh, uh, the GIS uh, group. Uh, get ready. Be able to deliver on time and fast and know what you can deliver and how quickly it can happen. And then work with the emergency management personnel to make sure uh, that they're familiar with what they can get and how they can get it and what it will do for them. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, we want to thank all the participants uh, that, that were here today, all the attendees. Uh, if you have questions that aren't answered now, if you think of other ones, uh, uh, we've got our addresses out there, whether it be for um, information from Peter or Melissa or myself. Uh, feel free to, to uh, write us and, and let us know uh, what the questions are. Thank you, Bruce. Um... So the first question I have is, um, I know the short answer to this, but you may be able to help with the long answer. Uh, did NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration participate in this process? NOAA, uh, NOAA through uh, Michelle Jacoby, uh, participated in this, and, and I don't know if she's in that specific uh, office. Okay, so we have some folks recommending that we uh, point to and, and, and mention the folks here, uh, the uh, ERMA GIS framework within that office. So um, we certainly can add that to a link, uh, you know, as a reference link um, to, you know, the future versions of this, which can be updated today. Um, another question then to Bruce or Melissa, um, in generally speaking from the GIS practitioner slash technician standpoint, um, what are the most important questions to ask during a coastal oil spill and how GIS can be used to answer them? You know, the, the questions that, that I, and I, through the interviews and stuff that I, I heard that people were asking, not from the GIS perspective, but from the emergency management perspective, were, you know, number one, where is the oil spill? Uh, number two, what are the sensitive areas near that spill or that are, look like they'll be impacted with the oil moving towards those areas? And, and those can be found uh, with the environmental sensitivity index that we referred to previously. Uh, they actually have those uh, laid out. And then where, uh, you, uh, what are the booming plans that are in place, the plans that have already been established? They're out there uh, through the uh, geographic response plans or the area uh, plans that, are, that have been uh, developed for the, the whole country as part of the Oil Pollution Act. Uh, and that's where you can get those. So you need to have both of those on hand ahead of time. Uh, and then the next thing, you know, you're going to need to know after you get involved in the incident is you're going to have to have a process in place to map out where the actual booming is taking place because that may differ depending on the atmospheric conditions. And uh, and, and then where uh, uh, people in the field are recording uh, oil hitting hitting the uh, the land. And kind of related to that, too, it's kind of part two of that, that Bruce and I heard quite a bit within the working group was the questions that Bruce just outlined are, are great, but some of the emergency responders that are dealing with the coastal oil spills maybe didn't know exactly how powerful GIS was or all of its capabilities. So one thing that came up quite a bit in the working group is we want GIS professionals who are familiar enough with this emergency response stuff that they can then suggest, you know, well, great, we've got the booming locations mapped, but now we can do this analysis or that analysis. So one thing we actually heard quite a bit was they wanted input from the GIS professionals themselves as to ideas on how it could be analyzed. That's th thank you, Bruce and Melissa. Um, Phil, Phil Balin, as he always does, gets right, right to the point with a $60 million question. Uh, what strategies have worked to get uh, the emergency response and GIS folks together 
uh, to see how they can share data uh, at a particular incident. And, and I'll take a one crack at this, and, and Bruce and Melissa, you may be able to help. Uh, the, the number one way to get cooperation is to train, <clears throat> to plan and train <clears throat> ahead of time so that the cooperation is just part of your SOP. Um, and this document is not going to teach people to share and play nice with each other, but if we train against this document and we utilize this document as a way to um, foster that collaborative collaborative spirit, then, then it becomes more effective. Uh, Bruce, Melissa, you might have a better way to look at it. No, I, I think that's a, that's a great way to look at it. Uh, one of the things that I always look for in, in that was successful in New York State was to find a way, whether it was just by pure luck in some cases, but uh, maybe plan out how you can, uh, even if the person isn't looking for GIS, how you can say, hey, this is what they're working on. What do we got that will make them look good? And then, and then bring it to the, the emergency management personnel, have them uh, take a look at it and perhaps use it, and if it's successful, then you're off and running, working. Once you establish those relationships, whether it's through uh, something like that or f through the training, uh, people are generally happy. If it, if it makes them uh, their job uh, easier and more uh, makes them more efficient or, or from a selfish perspective, it just makes them look better, uh, they uh, are generally receptive to it. Melissa? I would agree with both of those, actually. My experience, I haven't had a lot of experience with the external training. I, but I agree. I think that that's one thing this document pushes is how important it is to establish those relationships. And then, Bruce, what you said is exactly what, when, in the past, when I've worked with emergency groups, um, it has been going in and saying, hey, this is what you guys are working on. Here's what GIS can offer. You know, and here's how you can look at it differently. Here's how you can see it spatially. And once you get their attention, it, it's very easy to start collaborating between the two groups. Great. Um, yeah, one, one, other, one, one other thing. In New York, we actually established the liaison that went from the uh, GIS uh, uh, group out and sat down in the meetings with the other groups in the Emergency Management Center and, and would physically make those, uh, uh, those suggestions during the middle of their meetings, not obnoxiously, but, but generally, and uh, it was very well received. Um, two more questions. Um, we might have more, but two more questions. Uh, one is, uh, are there specific templates and symbology being proposed in this SOG? And I'll, I'll quickly answer that one. I think you guys can add to it. But the, 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 the SOG does include templated information and, and, you know, forms that you can, templates that you can utilize within your agency, change it however you want, adapt it. Um, and, and so it, it's not um, per se a standard, but it's a way to try to standardize a thought process and how we approach this. In terms of the symbology, um, we do have a separate symbology effort with a NAPSIG. Again, not to try to create a standard because we are not a standards-making body and we don't want to be, um, but we are trying to come up with a way to think about symbology in a less um, uh, kind of cut-and-dry approach and say there's a way to look at symbology and, and put some common sense principles behind it and we all, we all should know what it's trying to do. Um, the the other question then is, uh, or I guess more of a comment, and, and maybe Bruce or Melissa, you have a, um, a view of this, is the problem with the oil spill community is that there are too many different styles of mapping being used. Do you have a comment on that? I, I do not. Sorry. <laughs> I think that that's kind of true, not just in the oil spill community. I think that's probably true in, in most, you know, uh, specific community, you know, whether it is oil spill or, you know, fire department or uh, parcel editing even. And I think what's important and kind of, again, this is a guideline, figure out what works for your group and, um, you know, as long as you're consistent with your your mapping and your data, then at least that's one piece that's consistent. And sure, if it's a big event and other groups come in, you, there's going to be some issues there, maybe interpreting maps or, or things that look very different. but in my opinion, the first step is just to kind of standardize your own organization, your own stuff. Yep, that's great. Um, Jean Siri had a comment to share with everyone. Uh, GIS practitioners should look at the National Fire Protection um, Association's 950 and 951 um, that is currently out for review, and it's about data exchange, also called the NFPA Data Exchange Committee, um, and that can help 
better understand some of the data exchange issues that are coming into public safety from the standards making body. Um, thanks, Jean, for that. Great. Um, with that, I think we're done with the questions. Uh, I will um, close the session by just reiterating two things and adding one thing. Um, thank you very much to Bruce and Melissa for all the hard work they did, and thank you um, very much to the uh, work group that we put together for providing all the time that they did. Um, it was a really excellent effort, um, and, and we appreciate it. Um, more important, perhaps, is NAPSIG always takes the approach that there are a lot of things we know we're going to miss, there's some things we may not get right, and there's nothing like experience to improve upon things. So we do ask, to reiterate, we do ask that as you implement this template, this SOG in your agency, and you identify things we might have missed or things we might be able to get better, um, it would be terrific if you could share those experiences with us and help us improve this document. Um, we are. Uh, a group that really prides ourselves on constantly improving the work products that we put out. Um, the second thing is for those of you who might be particularly experienced with GIS and coastal oil spill and oil spill response, um, there is an organization out there called the Open Geospatial Consortium. They currently have an RFI out for oil spill response. Um, that is a very large group that is looking to try to put some standardization around oil spill and GIS. Um, we will be responding to that particular RFI, and if you have experience with GIS and oil spills, we would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if you don't know how to find that RFI, please just give me a, a shout by email at the email address that's on, on the page right now, and we'd be happy to direct you to the right place. With that being said, we're going to conclude the session now. Thank you very much to uh, all of you for participating on this. Uh, we